landlocked, poor, and 70% of her land being desert, Botswana did not have the economic or geographical capabilities to succeed as a nation. The 47th largest country, which is around the size of the American state of Texas, has a unique past, present, and upcoming future. Today, Botswana boasts the highest GDP on the physical African continent, along with an economy growing at a rate of 5% a year. All while having the title of least corrupt and highest HDI in the region, today Botswana seems like the diamond in the rough of its surrounding area. However, like many things, the actions of yesterday define today, or in this case, the actions of around 55 years ago have defined the country's position today. During the late 1800s, the land that makes up Botswana today was at the perspective of a two-front war, with Boer expansion from the south and southeast. And to the west was the Germans, who were expanding their empire out of German southwest Africa, now known as Namibia. And this vulnerable position of potentially facing off against the Boers and the Germans practically forced Botswana's hand into being admitted into the British Empire. The chiefs of Botswana at the time viewed admission into the British Empire as the lesser of two evils. Despite being a part of the empire, Bechuanaland, or Botswana, kept their governmental system and overall were not exploited to the same level as their neighbouring countries. The protector of Bechuanaland, or Botswana, had no real use to the British Empire and were only really viewed as a buffer state and a glorified entry further inland to the central region of Africa. The quote-unquote economic miracle of Botswana happened post-independence in 1966. When Botswana was granted independence, it was poor, to say the least. In fact, it was the second poorest nation in the world, with an economy mostly based on cattle farming and foreign aid. At the time, the average yearly income was 80 US dollars, and one-fifth of the population were reliant on government rations. The population was mostly uneducated, with 16 secondary school students being eligible for higher education in 1965. So the future of Botswana was not looking up, to say the least. In two years, the nation's economic future would take a turn for the best with the discovery of diamonds. Following the discovery of shiny rocks in the ground, the government and the diamond mining company De Beers established a joint company known as Debswana. The initial agreement reached in 1970 provided a royalty based on production levels. The agreement was an 85-15 split, with the government receiving a 15% equity stake and a 50-50 split in profits. However, Saretsi Karma and the government realised how profitable diamond mining really was, and renegotiated a deal with the De Beers Mining Company to get a 50% stake in the company, which saw total share profits increase from 50 to 75%. The discovery of diamonds certainly saw immediate and large-scale growth in Botswana's economy, which grew at around 10% a year from 1966 to 1996, with the GDP figures also skyrocketing. This was Botswana's golden ticket and her way out, but despite discovering diamonds, the road to prosperity was certainly not an easy one. Botswana's economic growth was occurring at the same time as the Cold War, which impacted Africa just as much as it did the Americas. Cold War Africa was unstable, coups were common, and the Dutch disease or resource curse was starting to become more and more apparent. Around the 1970s, Botswana, despite growing economically post-independence, was completely surrounded by hostile powers in similar fashion to the late 1800s. This time, instead of the Boers, Botswana had white minority ruled Rhodesia to the east, and apartheid-era South Africa to the south, and to the west was Namibia who were actually occupied by South Africa. So to put it lightly, I'm sure none of these powers were too fond of a black majority ruled nation which was doing quite well for herself on their borders. Even though the Botswana central government obviously didn't approve of the horrific actions of their neighbours, they stayed neutral in condemning their affairs while also offering sanctuary to many rebel groups. Diamonds make up 40% of Botswana's GDP and 90% of her exports. So it's safe to say that Botswana is heavily reliant on diamonds, but despite that, the country hasn't been plunged into civil war like many other African countries such as Sierra Leone and Angola. The main reason behind the majority of civil wars in Africa are ethnic and tribal tensions, which when it comes to Africa, sort of comes with the territory, with Africa being the most ethnically diverse continent in the world. However, Botswana hasn't experienced internal conflict 
despite being home to 45 different tribes. This is mainly due to only Swana and English being allowed to be taught in schools, which creates linguistic and cultural unity, and large amounts of power being removed from the individual tribe chiefs and into the hands of the central government, which removed identification with one's tribe and unified the people of Botswana. Think of this as a modern African version of the unification of Germany, where Germany went from this to this, and where Botswana went from this to one people group, kind of. Today, Botswana has a GDP of around $10,000 and is considered an upper middle income country. I'd say the nation has come leaps and bounds from a state of absolute poverty post-independence. Now, Botswana isn't perfect. Since 1985, Botswana has been in a war, not against the usual opponent, but against AIDS. Currently, 380,000 people have HIV slash AIDS in Botswana, which makes up a whopping 22% of the population, which results in about 5,000 yearly deaths. And still today, 14% of Botswana lives in poverty and her economy is extremely reliant on the price of diamonds not falling.